Set. <laughs> do I begin? Or yeah. Do I... Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Josh McCowan. I'm the Associate Provost and Director of the Office of International Education and Programs at SUNY Oswego. I'm joined by Megan Croft, our Senior Operations Administrator and the Lead uh, Administrator for the Faculty-Led Programs. This is the, uh, I think, the third one of these we've done in the last 18 months or so, and we're going to keep doing them. Um, and I think we might get through this one without mentioning the word COVID. We'll see. Um, but we started <laughs> too late. We started doing these about, I think it was a year ago, preparing for a restart. Um, and we did, and we'll, we'll share some good results that we've had this past year and hopefully encourage more uh, faculty led programming. Okay, Megan. So uh, the faculty led education abroad program at us we go was growing like gangbusters prior to that thing. Um, <laughs> and we had to take about a two year pause. Um, but when we came back, we came back deliberately limited. This was, uh, I think, a, a cautious but a wise decision for last year. But this present academic year, the one that's ending now, was really quite robust. Um, I'm not going to say it was as large as um, the, the before times, but it was really quite good. So today we're going to go over um, for those who don't know, or just maybe need a reminder or are curious about what maybe have cha has changed about our programs, uh, we are going to go through those things. Um, and I guess I'll, you know, refute what I said earlier, the second bullet there, no special COVID restrictions. We, we did plan this um, uh, with that very explicitly in mind. And that's important to note. If you paid attention to SUNY or to our programming in the last year, there were a lot. Now there are none, okay? So we'll go forward. So what program types and models do we have? And this you know, particular year was just awesome in that really all of these program models were, um, were deployed this year. So um, just to be you know, complete, when we talk about faculty-led education abroad or faculty-led study abroad programs, we're including quarter two and January programs. That means teaching in the second quarter and leading a group of students in January. Um, we also, as I say a little bit later, we have regular winter session programs as well. So that time frame in January is the same. It can be either a quarter two course or a winter session. Quarter three is um, still quite popular. I think it's this year was about as numerous as quarter four, but quarter three is uh, teaching then with March travel over spring break, quarter four, the same. And the only difference I would add with, with uh, the quarter four programs is they can travel really anytime in the summer. Most faculty though will choose right after school, that's out in mid-May. We have semester courses with optional travel. That is the least used model, but it's a really effective model for courses when it makes sense. In that model, Unlike the quarter courses, um, the quarter courses, by the way, tend to be extra service. The quarter courses are structured so that everyone enrolled in that quarter course must travel with the, with the group. So it's really a, a self-contained group. Whereas the semester courses with optional travel can apply to any, either semester to any course conceivably. So that means that... Um, for example, if you're teaching a class and it has 40 students in it, you might have 10 of those students choose to travel with you at the end of the semester. It's, it, like I said, it's the least used model, but it's a really good model when, um, for example, when teaching extra service is not feasible, or if you um, have a regularly enrolled course that's really quite large and it's a great pool of students to draw from, quite honestly. Summer and winter session courses. This was great this year. We had our first um, uh, winter session, dedicated winter session faculty-led program to Australia from the Health Promotion and Wellness Department, Elizabeth Kita. And then summer session, we had a new program just this summer uh, from the art department, Juan Perdiguero, who is a, a veteran a program leader of ours, debuted a studio art program in the summer. So fac our faculty can be actively involved in winter session and summer session too. Online programs with travel, this has not been 
been been a huge offering, but we do have one uh, this year. And in, in theory, any online course that we offer could include travel during those January, March, and summer timeframes. And then lastly, the domestic international programs. This has been quite small, but during COVID, it was really useful. We had a couple of good programs that were in the United States, but in principle, uh, any program uh, that you have in mind could be run in the United States. We are, um, I think, good at helping faculty plan travel and cohorts to travel together. Um, the provost asked us if we would take that on or asked me if we would take that on for faculty who were interested in domestic programs as well. Haven't had a lot of takers, but we do have that, that capability. Um, lastly, I say communication with department and dean. This is something that as our volume grows um, to, to the levels we're used to, I always encourage faculty to have that conversation within their department um, with their chair and or their dean. A couple of reasons for that. Um, firstly, uh, we want to make sure our programs are not um, competing with each other. Now, this has been a strange time uh, coming out of COVID. Um, the, the sort of form, the models and, and, and expectations we had prior haven't always held. I'll just give a couple examples. So everything to Italy that we've offered has run. Every, literally every program to Italy that we've offered has sufficiently enrolled, even when there were more than one Italy program going up against each other. Um, I don't know what, what that says. Whereas other very good programs, say to England or France, do not enroll. So we used to make some, some broader statements about that. But ideally, within your department, if, if several faculty are um, planning to teach abroad, and, and I'll use art as an example, so if um, Juan Perdiguero and Ben Etner are both planning programs, it would be, or Ren Young is planning a program, it would be great if they were sort of sequenced in a way that, and, we, and I've talked with the art department about this, for example, but any, it applies to any department, that, that there's sort of a, both a curricular and a faculty um, sequence that where students aren't like having to choose. That, that would be great. Could it work otherwise? Yes, but it would be great if that weren't the case. Also for faculty who have other responsibilities um, on tenured faculty or tenure track faculty, faculty who have important advisement and other responsibilities, I always encourage to have those conversations at the department level and dean level, um, since this is almost always an optional activity. All right, what has changed in the last couple of years? Um, I think from our standpoint, what I'm gonna say probably resonates with you um, as faculty who deal with students every day. Um, a lot of our students post COVID are um, a little bit, you know, not, not, not afraid, but they're concerned, and particularly about things that are uncertain. And I think that's broader than study abroad, but we're definitely seeing it in the education abroad space. Um, international travel always involves uncertainty, but the extent, to the extent that students may be a little bit um, leery of doing things, you know, um, and this will impact program design. So that's something we're observing. Um, but again, you're probably seeing this engagement and focus are a problem, just like on campus. Concerns aren't always rational. What I mean by that is, you know, we are having some some greater difficulty than before in getting students to follow through on things. And I think I've heard that from other parts of campus. That means the most basic things like filling out applications completely, providing information that we need, understanding what what the financial obligations are for this, and even though we feel we're very clear about it. So as you undertake this project and begin to design a program, just keep in mind that you're going to probably face the same kinds of issues with students that you are right now in the classroom. And when I say about concerns, I, I'm trying to say this also to myself and to my staff so that we're aware that students who have concerns, it may not be about the place that you're planning to go. In my the favorite example in the last couple of years is once we did resume study abroad, um, a student who was planning to go to Paris last summer uh, withdrew uh, because of the war in Ukraine. And there wasn't really a real clear reason for that. Nonetheless, they were concerned, right? And so that was my takeaway. They're not necessarily concerned about Paris or about the faculty member. It may be something else entirely that we're dealing with, okay? Um, and. Point three there, all the more reason that faculty leadership is crucial. We have seen some phenomenal programs, both um, returning faculty who've gone like Jeff Schneider back to Ireland, 
Juan Lamana back to Italy, Liz Balco back to Honduras. We've seen some really good examples of programs that ran before COVID that have come back and new ones and new faculty involved. I mentioned the Australia program, the, the new Spain program, new faculty, uh, Susan Hammerley going with Karen Stein to Tanzania. So we're seeing some really great program examples. I like to think though that without faculty leadership, those probably would not have happened. The locations are, are the same, but it's the, the student willingness to go and, and deal with that uncertainty often can be mitigated by faculty leadership. So all the more reason to, to have this program. So uh, implications. Clear, strong organization to communication and communication to students. It's not so much going, well, I do I want to go to Italy? It's do I want to go to Italy with you? I think is really the thing the students are asking. Watch out for too many hypotheticals and what ifs, but build in flexibility. This relates to that uncertainty issue. Um, study abroad as a profession used to really relish in the, the what ifs and the um, the, I don't know, the, the, the sort of the magic that happens when things aren't planned, the serendipity of it all. It's not really where we're at. And that's, that's just really candidly saying that after almost 30 years in this field. Just try to be clear, you know, build in flexibility. But if you find yourself with too many what ifs this time around, you're probably better to pull back, do what you're going to do clearly and explain it clearly. And I think students will, will be more relieved at that. Be in tune with shifting conditions. I don't expect anything um, beyond other regular traveler health issues to come up regarding uh, COVID. Um, but for all I know, some country may institute a lockdown. I don't know. So we all we have to be a bit mindful a bit more than we have been before, probably. Okay. Some of these, and, and Megan can uh, join in on some of this um, as well. But you know, COVID was not all bad. Right, and uh, there are some things that we we had to do coming out of it to satisfy particularly SUNY regulations that were actually pretty smart. So faculty staffing per trip. The discussion on this is, is as follows. So coming out of COVID immediately, I required there be at least two faculty or staff traveling with every group in the event there was a quarantine issue or, or an illness. I'm not doing that going forward. So it, prior to COVID, faculty members regularly led trips by themselves. There's no obligation, there's no rule that says we have to have two, but it, it made sense at the time. Um, that being said, um, there's a lot of advantages to having more than one. So if you're thinking about collaborating or if you're open to it, I would encourage you to stay open to it. It does add a little bit to the travel cost because we have to factor in two faculty staff um, flights and expenses, but the trade-offs can be really, really, really um, important. So we can have that discussion. Um, expanded proposal information process to meet SUNY guidelines. During, during the immediate post-COVID time, we had to do that. Now it's back to more normal levels. However, I will say that, that the experience of having to evacuate 175 people in March of 2020 and cancel programs and reschedule things, there were times when we had to give daily or multiple daily reports you know, on this campus to SUNY, which eventually went to the governor's office. So knowing where people are and what they're doing is more important than ever. I don't, I don't see that going back for a while and it kind of makes sense. So whereas in the past, we might've allowed a program um, to go with a, a really tentative itinerary. We're gonna err on the side of really trying to nail down where's the group, where they're going, day one, day two, day three. And that's good for our reporting, but also I think it's just really good for the, the era we're in with programming. Group flight structure. So for those who remember how programs were run uh, before COVID, we always built a group flight into the program fee itself. And it was something that was um, um, unchangeable. Coming out of COVID, we have found that some flexibility has helped on this. So you'll find that now when we've developed a program, your, the flight students still have to take uh, a flight and we will find and help you find that, but we don't build it into the program fee. It's a standalone cost. It doesn't add to the cost, but it's more realistic for where we are. One of the programs that we offered this past year, which was great and it was successful, um, folks that when it came down to the time of buying tickets, the ticket was almost $1,000 more than we had anticipated. All right, the airlines are in a lot of uh, flux right now too. If that had, if, if that had been, if it had been such that we had built a, that caught, we probably had to cancel that program. 
because the, the fixed cost would have been too high. So by, by allowing the flight to be purchased separately, you know, we went back to that student by student in that program and said, are you still interested in going? And they, they all said, yes, they would go. But that's a lot better outcome than having to cancel a program for financial reasons. So we can talk more about that. Um, we talked about itineraries a bit. The budget for eight, this is something that came out of COVID too. We're gonna stick with that going forward. Um, again, for those who may remember how it was done before, that, that would have been a pretty small number of students, but we're sticking with that, the summer winter session model. Eight is considered a full course. Um, you can plan for more, but we'll probably talk to you about that. So if we budget for eight and you get eight, you'll get to go. You know, if you want to budget for, you know, for more students so that you have a lower per student cost, we can talk about that, but we're going to expect you to do that. Um, so it's sort of like a, a cautious approach, but it, it worked well for us this past year. Um, in the past, I might have said 10, 12, 15 for the location. We're going to stick with eight for budgeting purposes, okay? All right. Next slide. All right. I think we're going to go through this rather quickly and then get into the, the nuts and bolts of how to run a program. Um, suffice to say that communication was and is still key to running good programs with us and with students and parents once they're on the ground. Um, we do have some revisions to our emergency communication plan that we've had to use this year. Um, for those who don't know, that once you propose a program and it's accepted and it's running, um, there's, a, there's a whole protocol for how you can communicate back with us, with me, with Megan, with other key staff. And that's current and revised uh, coming out of the pandemic. We will always have at least one meeting with me, probably multiple with, with Megan along the way. For new faculty who are considering running a program, um, I'm glad you're here because a lot of the information, or I'm glad you're watching this if you watch it later, a lot of the information I will go over personally with you about things like communication with your department and, and planning and budgeting and things like that. But I have found those meetings to be very important so that I understand what it is you're proposing to do you know, we're getting really interesting proposals, new ones as well to places we've never gone. And I feel we can run any program, but I, I do want to understand what it is you're trying to do, especially if you're going to some place new or some type of new program for both a risk management uh, as well as uh, uh, a supervisory standpoint. So after that, it becomes fairly uh, mechanical and Megan has some good slides later to show you on that. Um, point four there, working with on-site partners whenever possible. Again, this is, a, this is something we've always had, had always done, but we're really encouraging it now. Um, we have different program models. We have some companies, tour organizers, universities, individuals around the world who can set up programs for us. Um, whenever possible, we want to use those. And I contrast that with um, prior models where, where honestly faculty did a lot of that legwork on their own. We can talk about it if you have particular contacts or particular interest in doing that, but whenever possible, we really do want to use these entities, universities, companies, partners that have insurance in place, have itinerary experience, have an invoice and billing address and information that we could point to, you know, and not put that much, um, I guess, pressure on faculty to do these things, but, but also if, if we did need to sort of quickly find out where everybody is, we've got an organization we can turn to as well. So that's a little bit of a change since COVID. And I mentioned that about the uncertainty. So I think we're good about that. All right, next slide. All right, Megan, do you wanna take over about the program proposal process? Sure, thank you, Josh. Um, so to propose a program is pretty simple. Uh, we have everything linked right on our website. Um, so if you just go to svigo.edu slash international, this is what you'll see. Um, I circled on the left-hand side, faculty information and resources. Um, if you click on that, that will um, bring you to this page. Um, if I can. Here. Um, so down towards the bottom, it says submit a program proposal. When you open that, it's a Google form. So it's pretty simple. Um, it has a few questions. You fill them out. Um, and just be as detailed as possible, but um, 
you know, if you're not sure of something or you're still working on something, that's okay too. Because what we'll do is we'll look at the proposal, Josh and I will, we'll reach out to you and we'll ask you for more information or if you'd like to come in and have a discussion with us um, and we'll work together to build the program out. Um, one thing that's really nice about doing it this way is that it allows us um, to kind of have a more collaborative approach um, so we can have the discussion and kind of figure all the details together. So don't feel like you need to know everything right up front uh, because we can work with you and we can also provide you resources um, for items that you might not be sure of. For example, if we ask you to submit a budget and you're not quite sure how to do that, I can provide you examples of past budget submissions that you can use to then develop a budget. And like Josh had mentioned, we also have providers we work with and we're more than happy to help you establish that connection with those providers so that we can all work together to build a program that meets your needs and meets the students' needs as well. Um, a couple of things that Josh had mentioned, one of them was about the two faculty traveling. So one model that might be a little bit um, attractive uh, to new faculty is to collaborate with maybe another faculty member and travel with your classes together. Um, that way you have all of your students together and you'll also be together um, in case there's any issues overseas um, that could also help with budgeting as well. Um, with the proposals, we do want to kind of get everything together to start marketing the programs to our students when they return in August. So because of that, we would really like proposals in by July 15th. And that's not a hard and fast deadline, but that will give me time and us time to kind of work through the budget, get marketing materials ready. Um, and then our office has a study abroad fair that we put on in September, and we will invite any uh, faculty that have proposed to that fair but this will allow us time to have materials ready that you can deploy out to students. Um, so that's pretty much it. And um, any questions, you can feel free to contact me directly about the proposal process that I'm willing to meet with you virtually or in person, and we can kind of go through it together um, if needed. And Josh, you want to talk about the travel grants? Sure. Yeah, you saw that on that slide on our website, besides the program proposal, uh, we have resumed the Faculty International Travel Grant Program uh, at a really a, a smaller and more limited basis, but it's, it is active. Um, and we got applications this year. Um, I am pushing us back slowly towards the, the, the level of funding that we had had uh, pre-COVID, but we're not quite there yet. So right now we are looking to, to fund grant to proposals for faculty-led program development. Uh, in the past, it was sort of a broader understanding of that. We invited faculty to um, propose grant travel for research purposes or conferences or things like that. And we can't do that right now for financial reasons, but for faculty who are proposing programs, there is a small but, but sizable fund for that. And uh, I mean, sizable in the sense that it should be enough to get you where you wanna go. So I'd encourage you to, to apply for fall grants by the end of the first week of classes. And then I'm anticipating for, for next spring, summer, we'll be, we'll be much closer to the pre-COVID level we were at of funding for these travel grants. Um, I would encourage you also to look at uh, the union IDAP funding and your own departmental funding for these things. Now, if you have not traveled to a place before, um, that in itself is, is does not exclude you from, from leading a program, um, but we'd have to talk a lot about that, right? We do have good program partner relationships that should help, but it would be pretty hard for me to imagine a program running with a faculty member who had never been to the place that they're proposing mm -hmm. to, at least if they're by themselves. As Megan said, if you collaborate with someone, maybe that's, that's an ideal way to learn the ropes, uh, so to speak. Um, but yeah, right now we're saying point two there, if you're thinking about it, propose it, you know, and sooner rather than later, let's get started. Let's start talking about it. We have a program uh, already full for, uh, is it next January for South Africa, Megan? That uh, is with a new faculty, or two new faculty members. Um, it's already full. And it, would a program, it was a program I never would have thought we would have run. It's, it's uh, Martin Cohen and his a colleague looking at, um, coaching issues in South Africa. It's, it's, it's a massive program to think about, but we got this done 
early and enrolled. So that's about as ambitious as I can think of. And, and we're doing those things. Um, if you're thinking about a program that, that maybe uh, you think someone else is doing, or you wonder if you should do it, you can also reach out to me informally. Like I'll just share this right now. London's open, Paris is open. You know, I mentioned Italy before is um, everything we run to Italy has been successful. Um, Spain as well. Uh, we're gonna have two programs to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa this year and maybe nothing to London. I mean, it's wide open. So don't assume that someone else is already uh, doing that. If you're thinking about it, propose it. Um, and if there are some sort of issues of balance, we'll look at that internally and, and have that discussion with you. There's our, our names. I think we have email addresses somewhere. <laughs> but the three people besides me and Megan, uh, Aaron Pritchard is our financial manager. You'll be working closely with her. And I think the next slide we talk about uh, sort of some financial issues. Okay. Some revisions, but at the end of the day, not as many as I would have thought maybe a year ago. Um, I guess the first thing I want to share is sometimes new faculty who work with us don't know, but you don't have to pay out of pocket for anything <laughs> to do these programs. Um, a lot of faculty maybe have come from other institutions. That's not always the case. So if it's program related, you don't have to pay for it yourself. We, we, we will create the budget for that. Um, part of the program proposal process that Megan introduced includes a budget uh, proposal and budget development, I would say. That it may take a while. We don't expect you to have the full budget worked out at the time of proposal. But some guidelines to keep in mind. Um, we try to be as detailed as possible, probably more so than ever in terms of what we're spending and, and how we're paying for it. So we do ask that you don't, don't start buying things or about spending and, until you know that the program's approved and that, that it's, it's part of the, uh, of the plan. We really don't want, um, thank you for coming, Megan. Uh, we don't, really don't want faculty spending on their own unless there's no other way. And if there is no other way, that's what we discuss together. Um, you still don't need to spend your own money, but there's gotta be an allocation or reimbursement process. And as long as we understand what's happening as part of the budget, um, I'll approve it. Um, second bullet, paying for program components, minimize faculty, as I covered. Prior to COVID, it was quite common, honestly, for faculty to do a lot of this sort of wheelie dealing and reservation making. We can still do some, but we wanna minimize that for a lot of reasons, okay? And it also protects you. On the ground tour providers, we mentioned now specifically, um, this now it's CEA Kappa organization has been very helpful. Um, they have even more connections around the world than prior. Um, they're really an educational uh, study organization. Anglo-American Educational Services, more of a, of a tour provider based in London, but they have connections all over Europe. And then new partners that we've developed in places like Tanzania, Honduras. Um, I mentioned the South Africa program recently you know, there are some entities there we had not worked with or heard of before. So as a faculty member, if you've heard of or know of organizations, feel free to reach out to them. Eventually, we will discuss how we institutionalize those. It may be as simple as a signing a contract or agreeing to pay an invoice. Um, in other cases, it may involve something more, um, you know, detailed. A special request from faculty. This is, I think, even more important uh, because a lot of faculty do want to build in some um, discretion, bring family members with them, or just sort of have contingency plans. We've, <clears throat> I think safe to say we've dealt with it all, okay? But if you are intending, and, and I will say as an aside, um, bringing uh, a significant other or a family member or, or, or something like that, sometimes I can make the program sustainable, um, you know, over time, this is a, this is a major commitment and a major you know, expenditure of time and energy. And if, it, if it's keeping one from, from family time, that can sometimes be a reason us faculty don't wanna do it anymore. So let's talk about that. We can build that in. Um, there are ways to do it that are not gonna cost students or cost the university. Um, and we regularly deal with that. And, and sometimes there are um, very good reasons. The university does allow for um, other adults, for lack of a better term, to be official program volunteers to get extra supervision if you think that that's necessary. So we can talk about as like unpaid, un, unpaid volunteer, for example, can be a useful role. 
But if you wanted a little bit of extra time in the country, maybe to arrive early or stay late for your own purpose, we can build that in creatively. But let's talk about what those requests are in advance. As long as it's reasonable, I'm, I, I'm open to it. Travel advances from OIEP. Um, this is essentially unchanged from the past. Um, we were tinkering with some other ways to, for faculty to have uh, their bills paid for incidentals and things while they're abroad, but really this remains the best way to do it. So the method is that you'll receive, um, in addition to all the program components that we pay for directly, including flights and hotels and big ticket items, each faculty leader will get a travel advance from my office. That's a check that you can deposit and that gives you money uh, for your own incidentals that come up, but also emergencies that may come up. Um, and it really is the best way to do that. Um, if you don't use that money, you return it, but it, it is available for, for emergencies, especially over things that maybe weren't anticipated that are, that are reasonable. And as I said before, all program costs are covered, including connecting flights within the US. Um, the only things we wouldn't pay for if you want to upgrade to first class or business class, we're not going to pay for that. No alcohol purchases. Um, if there is some culturally relevant reason that you would like uh, to include that, let's discuss that. There have been regular examples of that. If you're studying the culture of Italy and you don't have a glass of wine, I don't know what you're teaching. Uh, but no, uh, there, there are legitimate cultural events that occur in Havana. There's a famous uh, rum museum. Rum is very important to the history and culture of that country. And uh, part of the museum tour involves uh, a rum tasting. You know, these are important things, um, but otherwise we don't pay for your drinks is what I'm trying to say. But um, let's discuss those items. Your family members can come, um, let's build that in. Um, but in terms of their own entry tickets, flights and personal expenses, we're not gonna cover those unless they're a member. Like I said before, like a, a, an official unpaid volunteer, we can discuss those items. Okay. I think that was, those are all our slides, right, Megan? A lot less, a lot less worry than even six months ago, for, you know, regarding COVID issues. So, so yeah, now is the time for questions as well as uh, discussion items too that folks may have. Should we speak into the microphone? It'll pick up. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Hi, uh, thanks, Josh, for the information. Very helpful. Um, so I'll give you a little background and then I have a question. So uh, I was planning on going with Lisa Glidden in political science to Cuba before COVID. She's been there. She knows she can speak Spanish. I cannot. This would have been part of a comparative revolution course, mainly enslaved people, but it could be others. And that didn't happen. So my thought is, I, in, in, I think she's going there this summer. She says conditions in Cuba are worsening uh, significantly. Um, so I was thinking of creating a, such a course that maybe we could go to Cuba if things improve, but also we could go to a place like New Orleans. And you said you're, you, you've done a little bit of this. I'm wondering if you could speak to that, like what you've done thus far. And I guess what, what is the student appetite for that? I think, yeah, great questions. Um, I think that the appetite will, like all our programs, the students will tell us what their appetite. My uh, observation so far anyway, and, and the programs we've run domestically that have enrolled well, um, the environmental filmmakers, Tiffany and Jared, um, they ran a very good program to the Adirondacks last summer. Um, they had gone to South Africa before to do environmental filmmaking. We're planning to go to Ireland before COVID. Um, they intend to resume international programming too, but. That was really our first major one and, and it went very well. What I saw, Megan, maybe you can add as well. What I saw is the same type of faculty leadership or enthusiasm that a student has for such a program or doesn't. I think it applies there too. Now in that example, I, I joked with them. I said, can you at least go to a mountaintop and look at Canada? <laughs> okay, but there really was no international component to that. And, and I, I accept that, um, you know, we are the Office of International Education and Programs. My preference would be, I'll give you another example that didn't run, but it, it, it could have, it was just caught up in the COVID times. Um, Ren Yang from ART was uh, planning to go to China to do a, a ceramic art program in Beijing. COVID hit and we were planning sort of a, a second, a plan B to New York City. And I think that program would have gone, but things in the spring of 2020, New York City was almost as cut off maybe as Beijing at that time. We, we just couldn't feasibly do it. 
Um, but I think that program would have run. And I think there are plenty of international themes you could find in a place like New York City or New Orleans. Or New sure. Orleans. Yeah. yeah. So I would encourage that. Okay. With or without a combined trip to Havana. Okay. You know, I thought maybe alternating, you know, those kinds of things. But, I think it's a yeah. great idea. Yeah. I, I remember uh, I spoke with uh, Rodman King before he left about, um, you know, doing a, a civil rights program yeah. in the South. Yeah. I, mean, I think there's some tremendous program opportunities that, that we could do on this great. campus. Thanks. There's some questions in the chat. Um, Lynn had mentioned, if you ask a friend to give a lecture or tour and they volunteer, can OIEP pay for their dinner as a thank you? <laughs> yes, I mean, the simple answer is yes. Um, but Lynn, in that uh, scenario, we regularly have um, honoraria built in to program budgets. So if you if you have a speaker or if someone is giving a half day of their time, for example, to, to a tour or, or share their expertise, uh, that is a regular expense item for us. So dinner, you know, dinner would be a really inexpensive way to, to recognize that. But let's talk about what specifically they're asking for or, or what you're asking of them, I guess is what to, what to say and, and go from there, but yes. She said, wonderful. Um, Crystal had a question in the chat. She said, do you suggest having preliminary discussions with a provider prior to making contact with your office? Hi, Crystal. Yeah, <laughs> uh, nice to meet you. What department are you in? Hi, I'm with theater. Okay, a lot of interest in theater this year. Great, good to, good to yeah. meet you. Um, I think so. Can I ask who the provider is? Is it? Is uh, I've it worked a, with Select Travel at my prior institution, okay. and they have a great uh, London build like building program. Yeah, I'd like to know more about that. Um, if I can, I'll, I'll share that. You know, none of the relationships that we have were 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 created in 1861 along with Sumas we go. <laughs> they all came to us and they, we've institutionalized them. So I welcome new partnerships and, and new players in this. Um, I don't know that organization, but mm -hmm. it sounds like you do. So I'd like to know more about them. Um, mm -hmm. If you have a particularly good relationship with them, I wouldn't see a reason not to do it, um, but let's see what it is. My, my, my caution to folks about this only is that um, education abroad uh, is a, feisty and competitive business. And there are a lot of program providers out there and some of them do contact faculty directly and they want you to do programs with them separate from us. And when I say us, I mean the institution. I mean, really clearly the way SUNY works and more than ever is you, you, if you go across a border with a student, that's a program. <laughs> Even if it's one student, one place doing a research project, that's considered a program and you're responsible for them. And so what sometimes these providers will do is they kind of backdoor to faculty and sometimes they throw incentives out there. Well, we'll give you, you know, free trips for your, come visit us. And, and when they don't, when, when a provider does not include us in that conversation, that's a red flag right there. Mm -hmm. And there are some particularly aggressive ones that don't want us to be involved. They want to be work with you directly. That's a real no-no from a SUNY standpoint, but just from a personal liability standpoint, I don't think you want to do that. But it doesn't sound like that's what you're suggesting. It sounds like you've got a good relationship already and you want to explore that. So as long as, the, if they're on the up and up and they're, they're willing to have a conversation with me or my staff and they're willing to sign contracts and things like that in a really transparent way, I have no reason not to work with them, okay? Great, thank you. Yeah, that looks, sounds interesting. I think Eric had a question. Yeah. Yeah, short answer is yes. Um, Sandy Barganier worked with a colleague at SUNY Portland uh, on a program to Florence, Italy. And I think we had a program, Megan, remind me, someone was working with a colleague at Colgate, I think, too. Where did you say? Colgate, remember that one? I don't think oh, I yeah. remember that. That might've been before me. Yeah, in principle, yes. Um, there are always issues to think about, you know, would we want those students to enroll for SUNY Oswego credit? That's, a, that's sort of one path to go down. If they're doing their own parallel program for their institution's credit, then essentially we're just traveling at the same time, okay? But 
In principle, yeah, it's quite possible. What are you thinking of, Eric? Uh, well, it's still in the early uh, phases of discussion, but um, I have a colleague who's a geologist and we've been thinking about doing a, a course to uh, uh, the Maritimes of Canada, particularly Newfoundland, and going to uh, sites of geological and, and, and botanical biological interests and the, the two overlap really nicely together. Nice. Um, and uh, again, we're just in the early, early phases of kicking these ideas around. And I was just curious about any sort of uh, thoughts you had on that. Yeah, it, it's more than possible. If it's a SUNY partner, it's, it's probably easier from a registration standpoint. If it's not, that's fine. Um, as I said before, one of the questions would be, did you, if you want those students to enroll in your Oswego course, it gets a little tricky if it's a non-SUNY, but that may not be what you're thinking. So we'll probably have to talk that one out uh, more, but I like the idea in principle, especially if it involves, you know, say working with a university that's got expertise in the Maritimes that we don't have, you know, that, that could be helpful to us actually. Yeah, my colleague had, um, has done research in Newfoundland and I've, I've traveled to Newfoundland many times. So we're both really familiar with it. And uh, it, I, I don't, it, he's not at a SUNY school. So um, yes. I think it might be more along the lines of trying to maybe him setting up a course at his school and, and me setting up one up here at Oswego and then having our itineraries sync together. Cause we want our students interacting with each other. Sure, sure. But yeah. I, I don't know, but I, I'll certainly um, tell him more about what I learned today in general and then can get back to you. Yeah, if, if it ends up going that latter route, in a, in a sense, you're gonna have two programs traveling at the same time, right? The program from that institution and our program um, that are interacting with each other. That's not unlike, you know, if, if you worked with, um, one of our program provider center, like CEA Kappa Center in Sydney, Australia, when, when Elizabeth Keita goes, there may be other students studying there on another program too. So in that sense, to me, it doesn't expose us to any other, any special liabilities or risks that, that we wouldn't have elsewhere. Um, the question for me would be, do, do those students wanna join our program and get our credits? If that's the case, we gotta think about tuition issues and stuff like that. Um, but if not, then it's probably pretty doable. Great, great, thank you. I'll, I'll certainly be in touch. I would love to run more programs to Canada in general. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a real opportunity that we haven't had much interest in, maybe because uh, the proximity didn't seem like uh, it was program worthy, but I'm, really, I'm glad you're thinking about it. Great. We did have a program, Megan, I think to the, to the Arctic, the, the, the writing program, remember that one? I do remember that. Yeah, that was with, um, was it creative writing? Yeah. Uh, Study the polar bear migration. Yeah, thing. exactly. The polar bear migration. Yeah, thing. that was really interesting. And Eric, I just want to um, also mention briefly, and we can talk more separately, but um, one thing to consider is um, the budget, because if there are things that are group costs and you're including two separate groups, enrollments may play into that. So that's just something to keep in the back of your mind when you're looking at like what the itinerary would look like. So I just wanted to throw that out there and we can talk more later about that if you like. Yes, yeah, thank you. That's good to think about, yes. So we have Crystal mentioned London and Eric's mentioned Canada. Are there any other, Frank mentioned New Orleans, any other specific ideas maybe people are having? No, I'm a um, FRM in heart and um, I haven't done much international travel at except to Canada. So I was just, you know, kind of thinking ahead, like maybe it would be a good opportunity to go as like an unpaid volunteer with, oh. you know, with some group just to get some uh, international mm -hmm. experience, but maybe also like a domestic program to give the international students, you know, another taste of the U.S. somewhere. Yeah. Um, but I would definitely need a partner in doing that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not much well, of a traveler. I know Alana <laughs> was on the schedule to be here today, mm -hmm. and I know she would like to very much to do a, a border program, mm -hmm. uh, U.S.-Mexico border. For mm -hmm. That would be a domestic program, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So there's some interesting ideas, Berkeley. I'm glad you mentioned that because, well, we can imagine the program growing to the level 
it, it was. I'm not sure we always want to imagine that, Megan. There's a lot of a lot of moving parts in those days, but there there have been times when I really needed program volunteers. You know, if you can imagine all the programs running and all the, the available folks were already doing something. So yeah, but glad you make yourself known. That, that could be helpful this year. Thanks. I do have one other just general question about regional coverage. Um, years ago, I had spoken to you about Scandinavia and um, is, is anyone going to Scandinavia? I'm particularly thinking Norway, Sweden, Iceland. Yeah, but, but uh, not in the STEM areas. You know, uh, Julia Giulio has run multiple programs, including just got back from Norway uh, doing a creative writing program. And that's a really well enrolled program. Uh, so yeah, but not, not in the STEM areas. I had a, another question about the competing with programs. Are you looking like quarter to quarter or are you looking like academic year to academic year? Um, Honestly, like right now, Crystal, I'm not, I'm not worried too much about it. Okay. I'm not too much about it. Gotcha. Um, but you know, if two people from the same department were running a program to the same country at the same time, Sure. We might, like Megan said earlier, you might want to like join forces here and try to have some common administrative items at the very least, or at least have a discussion about you know, maybe maybe you this year, you next year. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, we, when we were at our peak, some departments that were regular providers, um, they they had it mapped out like years in advance about who would go when, and, and they really, ideally, from an academic standpoint, wove it into the to the curriculum, right, in a really coherent way. Most of our programs have been sort of, if not outright extra service, they've been additional, not necessarily part of the core curriculum. They always could be though. And I think for me, I would love to get back to that place where departments were actively thinking about how these faculty-led programs fit in to their majors um, time at Oswego. So yeah. Thank you. So don't let that dis dissuade you from, from, a, from proposal, okay? Please do. Thank you. Lynn, are you ready to go next year? Are we ready to, ready to do this? I'm thinking about it, yeah. Go so um, the, I, I put in the chat that um, about doing a joint program, so I'm, I'm glad that Eric brought it up also because I have a colleague from Fitchburg State who regularly takes her students to Verona and I don't think we've ever had a program to Verona, right? Unless, Megan, unless, Juan or Ben took their students there. So I don't think so. I don't think so. So she typically takes them for two weeks to Verona in the summer. Um, and we've often thought about maybe doing it something together. Great. No, that's so, great. I hope so. But well, uh, Florence is still on the table, definitely. <laughs> yeah. So is so now Kappa is CEA Kappa? What's the difference? Now, why is it the, the name change? Uh, there was a merger. So okay. CEA was a longstanding and reputable, very reputable uh, international education organization, similar to CAPA, in fact, broader in its offering. Um, I think it's safe to say that, that COVID nearly put that whole sector out of business. And so there was, there's been a, a reshuffling uh, coming out of the pandemic and uh, CAPA survived. So did CEA, but they they really merged and they've got some um, you know some some shared leadership and and I think they have the the, the financing and, and the organizational structure that they needed to and to get through quite honestly. Um, so so far so good. We've run multiple programs with them, including short term faculty led ones, and I'm seeing excellent results from them. So I'm I'm actually hoping that the organization is stronger, um, including. Some locations. Now, Kappa was always very good, but their locations were pretty limited. You know, Australia, England, Ireland, Italy, uh, Spain. Uh, even that was late. Whereas CEA has, has had many other program sites. So it, they're only in their first year, not even, of this new organization. But so far, so good. And but we're watching them. And as, as we get more comfortable with them, I think you know their program locations in places like Czech Republic, South Africa. Costa Rica, they have locations and sites that CAPA never had. So I'm hopeful. All right. 
well, reach out to us if we can answer other questions or get you started. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you.